current level of economic development of Ukraine is no uh, so good. GDP per capita in Ukraine is five times less than those of Europe, and uh, the gap with other developed countries is even uh, wider. So, can Ukraine achieve 7 8 percent of economic growth per year instead of just 2 3 percent? Can, it, can this growth be sustainable? Because it's the only way for Ukraine to really cope with this challenge and to fill uh, this gap. And this is the only way to catch up with Europe in the foreseeable future. How to make sure that this growth is long-term and inclusive? That it will offer Ukrainians prosperity and better quality of life and that it will not deplete our natural resources completely, which is especially important. Yeah, you, you can see this international uh, comparison. It's, it's unbelievable. But we have all the resources, so we have everything to really change, change the situation. So actually, how to attract large-scale international investors into Ukraine and how can Ukraine find its global niche at the, at the world market and to pave its path to success? That is what we will uh, talk about today for the next two hours with our brilliant speakers. So let me briefly introduce them. Erik Reinert is a unique Norwegian economist and economic history researcher. He holds an MBA from Harvard and PhD in economics from Cornell University. Eric has gained extensive experience ranging from running his own industrial company to working as a researcher and economic expert in over 50 countries worldwide. Eric authored and the best-selling book, How Rich Countries Got Rich and Why Poor Countries Stay Poor, which according to the World Economic Association is among top 50 the most influential economics books for the last century. By the way, Dr. Reinert, I know that uh, you have over 40,000 economic books in your collection, uh, comprises economic history and economic policy for, for over the last uh, 400 years. So, Professor Reinert. <laughs> our next, our next uh, speaker is uh, Graham Maxton. Secretary General of the Club of Rome. He is a keen critic of modern economic thinking and co-author of the book Reinventing Prosperity. By the way, this uniquely uh, frank and deep book has been published in Ukrainian with the facilitation of Ukrainian Association of the Club of Rome. And you can find it here at Forum and uh, um, perhaps even have it signed by, uh, by its author. Graham is also the sole author of the book titled The End of Progress, How Modern Economics Has Failed Us, which was nominated by Financial Times' best book about the business award. It was top 20 Spiegel bestseller. Uh, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Holslach will uh, join us soon, and uh, now the next uh, speaker is uh, Jonathan Woitzel, director of the McKinsey Global Institute and senior partner of McKinsey and Company. He's responsible for cooperation with city and regional authorities in more than 40 accounts all over the world. Jonathan is also the Asia-based director of McKinsey Global Institute, where he leads research on productivity, urbanization, infrastructure, inequality, and regional economies. He has advised many national governments on these issues. Jonathan has written five books on China, uh, including uh, Capitalist China, Strategies for a Revolutionized Economy. He currently has three Amazon International business bestsellers. Thank you for joining us. And last but not least, Alexander Sayanka. He is Ukrainian statesman and politician, minister at the cabinet of ministers of Ukraine. He is responsible for the implementation of priority reforms and coordination of work of the secretariat of the government. He heads the reform delivery office under the prime minister of Ukraine. Alexander is also chairman of the Coordination Council for Public Administration Reform. Previously, he headed the secretariat of the chairman of the parliament of uh, Ukraine. 
So, dear, uh, dear guests, dear panelists, I will ask uh, each of you uh, one uh, specific uh, question and you will have around uh, eight minutes to reply and to share your opinion. Then I let the audience uh, ask a few uh, questions and after uh, I will ask you to give your closing uh, remarks and to give you recommendations, uh, five, five minutes each. We have a simultaneous translation, so please uh, use uh, headsets uh, when, uh, when needed and uh, please uh, speak right to the microphone because of, of some technical peculiarities. So the first, uh, the first round of, of questions. Uh, dear uh, Professor Reinert, one of the ideas that stands out on all your works is that it is of importance, it's uh, of utter importance for any state to have its specialization. So which professions should Ukraine choose in order to be a successful country, in order to compete globally and uh, to be a prosperous uh, nation? I also have to note that uh, the most influential neoliberals deny the very idea of uh, choosing, picking some preferred specialization or priority activities uh, uh, for Ukraine. Uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, um I think we have one basic problem, which is that um, of all the different economic theories that uh, have been around for the last 400 years, you know, I've uh, actually collected the books of people who agreed with, with me but are long dead, and they are actually the majority. Um, but the problem is that after World War II, we had a, an economic theory which uh, is essentially based on trade. You know, English economists were traders, and they didn't worry about production. So, so we, this year, David Ricardo's trade theory celebrates 200 years, and, and David Ricardo said that a nation should, should uh, specialize according to its comparative advantage, what it was least bad at. And at the time, the Americans said, uh, well, in a polite way, uh, you know, this is not the way to do it. We should not do like the English tell us to do, we should do like, like the English did. And what the English did was, like every other country did, uh, specialize in manufacturing industry. <clears throat> and if we go back 25 years and say, what was the Cold War really about? Well, the Cold War was about two political systems, communism and Western capitalism, and they were competing on manufacturing. They were competing in knowledge, they were competing in manufacturing. They had the same guru, Friedrich List, who was a German economist, was translated to Russian by the Sergei Witte. What we failed to see is the similarities between communism and Western capitalism. They both specialized in uh, they both specialized in manufacturing. And this is the understanding that was lost. That's why people talk about the, the Marshall Plan. I was interviewed this morning. Yes, the Marshall Plan was a successor of the Morgenthau Plan, and the Morgenthau Plan was supposed to punish Germany by deindustrializing it. Well, the Americans found out that, that we would have 25 million refugees out of Germany if you deindustrialized it. So they, re, they had a reindustrialization plan, which was the Morgenthau Plan. And I would say that the, the Ukraine has been subject to some extent to a, a Morgenthau plan. You, be, you have been deindustrialized, and, 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 and you're losing your population for that very reason. But if we look at the sustainability issue, this book was published by the Club of Rome in 1972. Very important, there are limits to growth. And this uh, is... Uh, this problem is still with us. What people are not that aware of is that there was an immediate response to, to limits to growth, uh, which was called models of doom. And these were Schumpeterian economists, innovation economists from Sussex, who said that, well, if you have a system and you have Marshall in, if you have Malthus in, you'll get Malthus out. If you put in a very pessimistic uh, equation, well, you get a very pessimistic result. So I think what we have to do today is to balance when was limits to growth, right, in many different areas, but 
when were the people with models of doom right? And then I think we, 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 can, we can say a lot about um, strategy as well. So, um, some economic activities are subject to increasing returns. This is what you are, this is your question. What kind of economic activities should uh, we have? And I Italian economists in the early 1500s were, were looking at the gold flowing in from Spain to Europe and say, why does this gold end up in places like Venice and Amsterdam where there are no mines? And they went into the economy and made a very simplistic uh, taxonomy Increasing returns, if you produce more, your costs fall. Then economics become an optimistic science. But if you, um, if you have um, also technical change, you got what the economist Schumpeter called historically increasing returns. And this is an example where I think, we, and China is a good example here, uh, we, we, we can have progress and sustainable pro progress. Manufacturing of energy. Uh, other econo economic activities are subject to diminishing returns. Agriculture is subject to diminishing returns after a certain point, and it is subject to perfect markets. This combination of diminishing returns and perfect markets makes it 100% historically proven that no country based on agriculture has ever gone rich, has ever got rich. The Americans said, yes, we have the best wheat in the world, but if we, if we only grow wheat, we'll stay poor. So we have to do manufacturing. And this is the same story of the Ukraine. Extraction of energy, you know, uh, digging deeper and deeper into the sea to get out more oil and gas is not sustainable. Right? Um, so uh, we have to get away from that. But in the case of, uh, in the case of mining, that may, might not be that easy. I think probably uh, a gold ring will still produce a couple of tons of more or less toxic waste in the future. So, so gold mines, you can't be optimistic. But energy, I think you, you can be optimistic. And this is an old curve. Um, but it shows the cost reduction for solar panels uh, in China, you see it's, it's going down extremely fast. This is on a logarithmic scale. You know, solar power is increasing in productivity now very similar to, to what information technology did in the 1990s. So, so we, we can actually be fairly optimistic of that. You know, when we harvest the sun, there, there is no less sun. When we harvest the wind, there is no less wind. But when we extract oil or, or gas, well, there is, there, is less, there is less of it. So I think this is a very important problem, a, a, a very important issue. And another thing, when we talk about sustainability, is that um, we have some tremendous measurement problems. I looked at the cost of three-minute transatlantic phone call in 1927 uh, between New York and London. And I upgraded that, not by the consumer price index, but by wages, you know. This, what wage would you have today compared to the wage at that time? Well, now we can do the same thing with, with video for free on Skype. Well, well, what does that mean for economic growth? Uh, it means, oh, certainly, this is an example of creative destruction. You know, the, the idea that new technology come over and destroy old ones. Um, is it an example of degrowth? Because certainly in terms of GDP, there are much less phone calls, right? But since we don't measure GDP in number of minutes in, on phone calls, it doesn't show up. Uh, an example of the stupidity of measuring GDP, I, I think so. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we should stop doing it. It just means that we should measure other things as well. For instance, pollution, impact on the planet. And then, you know, if, if the growth is in, 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 in fiber cables and, and, and uh, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't be that worried. If it's in coal, we should be worried. All of the above. And I think it's, it is essentially all of the above. So I'm suggesting a fairly 
simplistic taxonomy here, increasing returns and diminishing returns, uh, in order to be, have an optimistic uh, view of the future, well, we need increasing return industries, which is manufacturing and services. If, we, if the Ukraine gets stuck in diminishing returns with perfect markets, agriculture, to that is added quotas to the EU, which run out in late January or early February, your annual quotas, you know, you're, you're in trouble. I think you, you're locked into a situation where you get more and more debt, which is not sustainable, and, and, and I think you have to rethink your, uh, your economic strategy. Talk about the Marshall Plan, well, look what, what Korea did. You know, when I went to school in Oslo, Somalia was richer than Korea, and, and, and then something happened, and, and Somalia stayed poor, and, and, and Korea got rich. There's, there's, there's things there to, to learn. Professor, thanks uh, a lot for such uh, important recommendations. We really, we really appreciate it. So we, we really uh, should look for, for these types of activity with increasing returns and manufacturing is a, is a primary specialization for country which are going to, to become rich. Thank you so much. I, I hope that our government will also hear that and uh, that they <laughs> took it as a guideline. <laughs> it's very important. And uh, it's difficult to object you on, uh, on your remarks on uh, GDP because uh, uh, Simon uh, Kuznets initially, he did not intend to use uh, these indicators as, for, as a well-being uh, measure. So actually, we really should uh, have a more comprehensive uh, indicator to, to, to get a holistic uh, holistic picture of the well-being. So thank you, thank you so much. And he studied in the Ukraine. Yeah, <laughs> not many people know that so actually it's very important. We, we should know our heroes. Uh, so uh, dear Dr. Maxton, uh, Bosan Havrilishin, a prominent uh, Ukrainian, co-founder of the World Economic Forum in Davos and uh, full uh, member of uh, the Club of Rome, in his report to the Club of Rome, uh, towards more eff effective societies, suggested the following uh, recipe for Ukraine. The most important task is to achieve an 8-10% GDP growth per year while reducing inflation. Today we have only 1-2% of uh, economic growth and it's communicated as a success. Uh, Graham, how can, you, uh, how can we persuade our Western uh, partners that Poor and rich countries require different economic uh, policies, um, as you state in your book, uh, Reinventing uh, Prosperity. Yes. Victor, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think just picking up with what Professor Reinhardt said, we need to change what we're measuring, uh, and we need to change our economic system, and we need to redefine work. Let me also start with, with the limits to growth and, and try and explain where we're coming from. The limits to growth has, has a number of scenarios in it about the future. It looks at 200 years of, of human development, and you can see perhaps the most famous chart from it here, which shows what we were anticipating. So this is from 1900 through to 2100. And it looks at a number of key measures. It looks at industrial output, it looks at food output, population, uh, the pollution level, and the use of non-renewable resources. The first uh, vertical line you can see, the dotted line, is in 1972 when the report was published. And the report was done by a, a team of scientists at MIT. And they said that if we carry on increasing the human ecological footprint at the current rate as we were doing in the early 1970s, then the system would collapse. It would enter a crisis around 2030. Now, the other vertical line is where we are today. Now, when a human system collapses, when a complicated system collapses, it doesn't happen quickly. It doesn't happen over six months or six years. It happens over decades. Now, we would argue that that process of collapse is underway, that the financial crisis, that climate change, that the migration problems, the political problems that we're having are all signs that the human system that we've built for so long is beginning to fall apart. Dennis Meadows, who was one of the authors of Limits to Growth, and I was with him two weeks ago in Budapest, 
says that it's too late for sustainable development. So when we talk about sustainable growth and sustainable development, to some extent, we're trying to do something which cannot be done. Now, why does he say that? Because today, we live as if we had 1.6 planets. Where I live in Switzerland, we live as if we have four planet Earths. In the United States, they live as if they have five planet Earths. We're living beyond the capacity of nature. And because of that, we have problems like climate change, we have excess resource use, we have the pollution of the seas and the oceans, and we have all the other social problems because we're living beyond the bounds of nature. So what we need to do is manage our economic systems to bring them back into balance. Why, why do we have this problem? Why do we have this situation where we've, we've increased our ecological footprint to an unsustainable level? Well, there are probably three reasons. One is population growth. When I was born in 1960, there were three billion people on the earth. Today, there are 7.6 billion people on the earth. And we're increasing the human population by around 100 million a year. The second reason is the short-termism, short -termism, that we think about the, the short-term issues much more then we think about the long-term issues. We're focused on, on, on increasing profits every three months, not on the danger of climate change, which will ultimately kill millions of us unless we do something to stop it. The third reason is our economic system. And I, I, you know, I put this, this picture up of The Economist. I used to write for The Economist, and, and now I'm not so proud that I did because it... It encourages us to think about an economic system which is focused on GDP, focusing on growth. We focus on that because we think it is going to improve well-being. We think it's going to create jobs. We think it's going to reduce inequality. We think it's going to, re to lift six billion people out of poverty. We have this mental map in our heads that says growth is good, that free trade is good, that the environment doesn't matter, and that small government is essential. And all of this thinking is wrong. All of this thinking has led us to this problem and led us to this mentality of this little rabbit on the side that says, I want more all the time. So we have this short-term mentality that makes us think that a new iPhone and a, a smart new car and higher quarterly profits is somehow good. But in the long term, we're doing a huge amount of damage. We're creating this, this vast increase in population. We're creating this migration problem by increasing the level of the gap between rich and poor. We see the rate of growth per head declining. We see happiness stagnant. And we see that we are plundering the world's resources. So we have something which is fundamentally unsustainable in the long term, but seems to be okay in the short term. What are the solutions? Well, I mean, when Victor gave the introduction, that's what, that's what the book that I've written with Jürgen Randers, who is one of the other authors to Limits to Growth, is about. How do we find solutions to shift the economic system onto a, a better, healthier path? Now, this is actually written for the rich world. We've, we've, we've focused on Europe, the US, and Japan, about how we can shift the economic system there. And we've, we've suggested things like sharing jobs by shortening the working year so that the benefits of digitalization are spread more evenly and the gap between rich and poor is decreased. About taxing fossil energy much, much more to increase the incentives for a shift to a more sustainable energy system and also to redistribute wealth. To restrict trade when it's necessary because trade should be to the benefit of the majority, not just a few big corporations. To tax businesses and the rich more and to provide a minimum income for those who need it. Now, a lot of the, these, these ideas are not suitable in somewhere like Ukraine or, or in much of the poor world where different economic thinking is required. But what I'm trying to say in this, in this book and what I'm trying to say today is do not adopt the system of the West. Do not adopt the system which is focused just on GDP growth and open trade because all it will result in is the rich getting richer and your resources being plundered. You'll end up with out the means of economic development in the long term if you adopt that system. Adopt a system which has got a broader measure of progress, which serves the majority of people in the long term, and which is much more sustainable for the environment.
Thank you. Thank you. Professor Maxton, uh, thanks a lot uh, for such a radical but uh, necessary recommendations and we can find really a number of parallels in, in Ukraine with the situation because currently we have um, slow economic growth or, or one or two economic percent uh, per year and uh, which is primarily based on the uh, commodity export. We have the highest volumes of export of grain, for example. Previously, we exported uh, log wood and metal scrap and many other uh, raw materials. And uh, actually, we see that uh, this way of development, uh, this uh, mechanism of achieving economic growth, uh, it won't make Ukrainians uh, more successful, happier, healthier, or even wealthier. So we really uh, have to... Uh, rebuild our economy and to reshape our, our uh, measures of success. Thank you so much. And uh, dear uh, Mr. Wojtzel, taking into account your tremendous international experience, you can look at our country through the eyes of your clients, multinational corporations, strategic investors. What do you see for today and for the future of Ukraine? What recommendations would you give to your customers with regard uh, to our country? Which strategy should Ukraine adopt to win in the competition for investments and uh, jobs? Okay, thank you. Should I? Uh, yes. Thank you, and a great pleasure uh, to be back in Ukraine. I'm always asked, is it my first time? No, so I think about third time, but uh, since the time I have uh, come, been here last, there have been many uh, changes, uh, very positive changes. So I am very happy to be here. Uh, I also feel uh, very appreciative of the chance to listen to my fellow panelists who have a great depth of knowledge around areas that as a, a practitioner, I can only uh, be appreciative of. And uh, my work, as you said, is with clients uh, in the private sector and in the public sector. Uh, my work has been in China for the last 32 years. Uh, so it is, I, have, I have the movie of uh, how economic development goes, and I'd be happy to share a little bit of that. Uh, but also from uh, the McKinsey uh, Global Institute's perspective, which is our global research. So, as you can imagine, from a client or a practitioner's point of view, what we are interested in is understanding how do you get things to happen? <laughs> so what is the opportunity and how do we capture growth opportunities? Very similar to what you were, you were stating as a challenge here. And from that point of view, from an economic, we would sort of step back and say, I mean, one thing really matters, and that's productivity. So, and it matters more and more and more. And uh, I think the comments about increasing uh, returns uh, and sort of industries in which reflect increasing returns uh, is similar to that, in the sense that this is total factor productivity growth. Uh, so you get US and UK over long periods of time, and you can see that over time, the, the proportion of growth which comes from productivity as opposed from uh, simply uh, fixed capital investments or uh, energy related issues. It's the, the productivity portion of growth uh, is in the ascendant. It's uh, much more important today uh, than it was 50 years ago and it will be even more important going forward. So where does this productivity come from? Where do we, how do we find it? And I think that largely speaking, as we think particularly about the Ukrainian context perhaps, there are two very significant drivers of productivity. Uh, and the first one is uh, the global trends towards uh, urbanization, urbanization, industrialization. So um, let me just put this up. There are, we think that roughly 440 cities, emerging market cities, will be responsible for about half of global growth. Uh, and uh, those are the cities in red there, the little dots. Um, and we didn't put the Americas, there are a few in the Americas, uh, but uh, it is largely those cities. And so from that perspective, this, if you will, is a, a good neighborhood to be in. Uh, these, uh, this process of urbanization and industrialization is essentially one of 
liberating human potential. It's taking people from what is essentially a surplus economy where they could not exchange <coughs> goods and services and they didn't have education and they lived shorter lives and they were subject to cultures and traditions which would not allow them to marry the people that they would like to marry or to go to the places they would like to go. It's taking all those barriers away and putting them in a context where they can find out what they are good at. And uh, that by putting them together in high density, high frequency environments where you interact, you become specialized and you become more productive. We start doing more of the things that we're good at and we stop doing the things that we are bad at. Uh, and this is what urbanization does for the world. And as you are closer to urban centers, you benefit more from that. And so as we think about that from a company standpoint, what we see is that uh, in the last, uh, uh, if we say today, there are about 8,000 companies which have revenues of over a billion dollars. This is globally about 8,000 companies that have revenues of over one billion. And we look forward to the year 2025 and we would say there are about 15,000 companies that will have revenues of over a billion dollars. Seventy percent of those companies will come from emerging markets. So 70 percent of the new companies, the new unicorns, uh, they will be from emerging markets, and that is because of this, this trend of urbanization. This huge explosion of human potential, of productivity, is in turn creating a huge explosion of companies. So this, from a Ukraine op perspective, is a huge opportunity. So how to trade, how to engage, how to be part of this uh, new global uh, Silk Road, or <laughs> you could say, or just simply the new global urban economies. So there will be three billion consumers associated with these additional 8,000 uh, companies. And uh, being part of serving those, being part of integrating with those, trading with them, sourcing from them, selling to them, uh, that is the first big productivity opportunity. So that is one. Uh, the second thing I would, we think about is that for, uh, as we say, the technology, what is, what is productivity really? It's, it's doing something better. It's being smarter about what you do. Uh, which can ultimately be said to be a function of innovation or just we call it technology. And we are now at a point where this new wave of automation is in turn not going to be one technology or two or this or that, it's going to be the whole thing. So when we say industry 4.0, we mean AR, VR, we mean uh, 3D printing, we mean nano, we mean uh, in, in I IoT, we mean the entire transformation where we go from an environment where we told our objects what to do to the world where objects have the intelligence to self-organize and help us to do things better ourselves. So we have to adapt to the fact that we have now created things that have a certain level of intelligence. And this creates a huge opportunity. This creates a huge opportunity to do things better, whether it is medicine or it is construction uh, or it is accounting and financial services, but there is not a sector that will not be affected by this. And we believe that automation technologies, you know, 60 to 70% of G2B growth going forward will be coming from automation technologies contribution. And now we can, I agree with the comments on GDP, of course, that this is an imperfect measure. So, but I would argue that in addition to the economic benefits, this will have massive impacts on the quality of life, uh, the ability to have longer, more healthier lives, uh, to have greater access to education, to have greater engagement of the citizenry. This is all true, but let us just stay with the economics. What we have observed when we look at companies, uh, that we have digital halves, and we have digital have-mores, in the sense that everybody does have a smartphone, everybody has a computer, but how do you use it? And to what extent does this technology become part of what you do on an everyday basis? And what we would say there is that companies that are good at using the technology and countries that are good at using the technology, uh, they grow faster, they have more profits, uh, they are more innovative, and importantly, they have higher wages. So for all of you that have children, I am sure you are telling them that they should become very familiar with the digital environment and they should work for companies that are using digital technologies because you hope that they will have good jobs that will pay them well. And so we are starting to see a real, uh, if we will, uh, a span, a spread between the companies that are good at using technologies and the ones that are not. So obviously Ukraine this plays to a strength with over 140,000 engineers uh, being graduated every year. You can be one of the digital front runners. 
you can transform the companies and the economies and the government so that this will then create a great economic but also social and environmental benefit. So those, I think, are two very big opportunities for the Ukraine. One is to participate in the productivity revolution that's going on globally through urbanization, and the second is to be part of a digital front-runners uh, club, if you will. But one last point. The last, we've had this happen before. Uh, the last time this happened was the transition from agriculture to urban, uh, and it was a bumpy ride. There was a lot of uh, conflict. Uh, this picture is what is called the Battle of Peterloo, uh, so-called. It was, in fact, a demonstration uh, in the UK in the eight, late 1800s uh, from people who had come, who were protesting for universal suffrage, uh, but also for uh, rights to uh, for public housing, for improvements in public health. Uh, these were all the things that did not exist for the formerly agricultural class of the UK that wound up in the cities at the time of urbanization. And there was fighting, of course, as you can see on the bottom there, uh, as the people who had those things did not want to give them to the people who did not have those things. Uh, and that ultimately, though, did result in progress. And that is how we got high schools, and that's how we got public health, uh, and that's how we got unions, and that's how we got universal suffrage. So sometimes you have to fight uh, for what you want. Uh, I think that today we are in a similar place, uh, where we are now moving from urban to digital. And people who do not understand the digital world, they will not be educated for it, they will not have health care, they will not have housing, they will not have jobs. Uh, and so we need to find a way to integrate them. We need to find a way to create, if you will, a digital bill of rights uh, for the next generation. And I believe also Ukraine can be part of that in providing that type of a safety net, but also an enabling ladder for all people in society to participate in the productivity revolution. Mr. Wojzel, thank you. Thank you so much. And let, me, let me ask you uh, one uh, question directly. If you look at our uh, economic figures, uh, particularly the FDI per capita in world stock, you'll find that the, the, the total uh, figure is something about uh, 40 billion US dollars. At, and the, the major economy, the United States of America, is ranked only uh, 14 in the ranking of uh, investors uh, into Ukraine. The total FDI from the United States of America to Ukraine is something about uh, uh, 500 million US dollars. Uh, it's a tiny figure. And uh, Chinese investment in the Ukraine is even uh, lower. So what the major reason, what the major blocks uh, which uh, should we eliminate in order to change situation drastically in the foreseeable uh, future? Well, of course, I agree that it is much too low. <laughs> so we should, uh, we should have a much higher aspiration, and I, we've talked very briefly about this. I think that in order to create a new environment, you have to start somewhere. You have to start somewhere quite specifically. So creating a special place where you can uh, find what it is needed to start this process of productivity growth. If I reason from the Chinese experience, uh, China started its... Uh, reforms with two big things. One is the opening to the outside world, uh, and the other is the four modernizations. Uh, the opening to the outside world was a way in which the China would introduce foreign technology management and capital uh, in a specific way that would allow for competitive advantage to be built in a specific place, and they created special zones to do that. Most of them were failures, but the ones that worked were then very successful and were copied and they, came, they became the primary way of developing the economy. So I think that is one thing to consider. So what in which areas uh, physically could you create the right context for investment to earn a good and productive return, productive in the broader sense, not just in economic, but also good employment, good jobs, good impact on the environment. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there are opportunities to do that, so that is one angle. The other of the four modernizations is a recognition that there are places in the economy that simply have not benefited from the opportunities to become more productive, whether it's in agriculture uh, or in the case of China, the uh, industries, the financial system, uh, even the military. Uh, these became areas for reform. Uh, every country is different. So I would, but I, the, the point about special zones and creating the opportunities for investors to identify competitive advantage, uh, I think that that is true globally. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Пане Олександре, не секрет, що ви є... Олександре, I think that it's not a secret that you're the Minister of the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine. You're also the right hand of the Prime Minister of Ukraine. And the challenges are very high. The, the stakes are very high. And we don't have the needed time and resources. But you're spending a lot of time and spending a lot of efforts in the reform of the state public management. Can you please tell us whether you believe that it will be able to implement this reform successfully, the reform that we tried to implement many years before, and whether, in your opinion, we'll be able to do it in that way that the public management, the public service management, and the public service and the state service were dealing in the interests of the state of Ukraine and not working on the interest of even foreign states. Uh, Victor, thank you for your question and the reform of the public governance and state governments is very important. We've heard a lot of advice nowadays and we have the support of the international partners. We have the expertise and expert support. We have the understanding of what strategy has been chosen by different countries in that time and in their situation. But there's also Another understanding that the developed, de economically developed countries, they have the possibility to give the priority to the prior priority spheres, the billions of dollars to support them with, with the fundings. And the countries, they receive the international support, financial support. And now Ukraine is a quite complicated situations under the foreign aggression. We're spending 5% of the GDP just to support our military. Our militants. I think it's very important for us to choose the priorities, to get the strategies of what we would like to implement, and the people who are implementing and working on the strategies. The global efficiency of the public servants, of the public of the state governance is very efficient because the slow pace of this process can create the gap between Ukraine and the international community for centuries. It's crucial for us and we have to now speak about the innovative systems of the state governance and state running. And what we have now managed to do, we have created the number of different activities that are help us to implement the high quality movement in this direction. The system of the state governance now is, and the state management is having into consideration all of our historical premises, the center of the politics and strategic thinking was in Ukraine. And when in 1991 we regained our independence, we haven't built on the basis of the cabinet of ministry, we haven't built the center of the Ukrainian politic building. Why are we saying that all of these ministries are being now governed by the law of the 1961? The ministry has to be now the very powerful analytic platform to develop the high quality government decisions. Sometimes the decisions of the government are not being counted in the right way. They're not being monitored on the effectivity of the implementation of it. So in the framework of this reform of the state governments, we need to change the ministers into the analytical platform that will prepare the analytic, the governance strategies, that will calculate all of the variants to find the best solutions for any problems and challenges. The next question that we've already mentioned, we need to think about the digitalizations of the systems. The systems, our system is now works with a thousand, hundred thousands data that we're working at. We're building up the system, working with big data. We've created a separate portal to work with the open data that give a big push and big lunch for different sectors of economy. We're speaking about the using of the blockchain technology. I think that you know that Ukraine is the first country who's using the blockchain technology on the state level. We've uh, set up the SETAM auction 
also our land register using the blockchain technology. We'll, we'll come up with a concept of digitalization of Ukraine up to, 20, up to 2030s. And now we're speaking on the system of effective regulations. We had the discussions for many times when people spoke about the deregulation. We've speaking on the contrary. We need to build the system of efficient regulations in Ukraine. We need to understand what rules and what regulations work in what sphere and in what way. We think that we have to understand it right now. It has been proven by many international research that has been made, and the ratings of the UN on the economical vulnerability. The efficient system of the government management, it has a direct dependence on the economical development also. So when we speak that we need to Force and enforce and the work of the ministry that we start the principle of the politic, politics analytics that we open and start working with big data that we're starting the strategic planning on budgeting that hasn't been held before. We are now offering the state service. We're offering the piloting project now. We are offering the people the the market salaries and giving this competences as our conditions that have been spoke about on the economical topic and that are the priorities for the people for 2030s. We are now building the capacities, the professional, professional capacity of our state servicemen. And now we're trying to get the independent recruiters, independent experts, and independent competition into the competition for the states, the state's posts. And I think this is of the primer importance for us. In order to implement our, successfully our reform, we have to join our efforts, and we're going to succeed in that. I think that it is important that our topic today, we're speaking about the institutional capacity. We're speaking about the professional of the state servicemen. We are talking about about it in the context of economical strategy, and it's of great importance for us. Thank you, Alexander. And I would like to have another question to you, if I may. You've said, and it's a very right direction for the implementation of the innovation in the activities of the ministries, cabinet of ministries also, and getting the blockchain into action. But we have mentioned before and on the plenary session in the morning and during the press conference, there was one really great idea that is right on the surface on one hand. We have been told that of course, we understand that you need to get into the new markets, you have to get into new niches and work with innovations. But then again, you have to keep your head out of the clouds and take a look at your feet. There's a lot of resources just in front of your feet that are not used in full in our, in our country. For example, Ukraine has its own fossil fuels. We have different resources for the coal and gas. But for the last year, we have imported these fossil fuels for almost like $4 billion. US dollars. Or for another example, Ukrainian forest, the timber, the area of the forest is the same that the area of the forest in Poland, but the Polish people there have 28 billion US dollars a year, and we do two billions a year. And the Polish people, they feel the lack of our forest. They want to buy more and more forest. They want us to take away the moratorium on the forest and the timber sale. Can you tell us more whether the government, as far as you're working with innovation, whether you will join if to the, your efforts and power for Ukraine to use the productively the resources that we have in the direct and literally under our feet, whether we use our own capacity efficiently, not to be, again, begging the creditors to help us every year. Victor, thank you for your question. I do understand that we all understand how important it is for us to develop our own industry and to create the products of added value here in Ukraine who could be ex that could be exported and could create the additional income for the Ukraine that can be used further for the salaries, for improving the quality of the health care and education, for the social protection of the citizens. And the Prime Minister today mentioned that we have created three main institutions, the Office on the Export Supports and we are now putting a lot of attention to change the structure of the export, to stop being the country of the commodity exports to the product exports, to get into the other exports, export structure, to be exporting more of the products with additional value. And we see 
that one of the one of the stakes, one of the shells that we're now increasing in exports, these are the IT services. It's not just the commodities that we export. Then the next direction for us is the support for the investment in Ukraine. We do understand that Ukraine is in the high need of investor nowadays. And we do speak about the effective governance, effective management of the state-owned companies. We do not want to refuse the state-owned companies. We have more than three South and state-owned companies. Some of them need are in a badly a badly need a good modernization. And we're looking for a good manager, good owner for the in fact, as, as of the international investors, for these companies to be modernized and create the work in places in Ukraine. And the third very important component is the development of the, our national economy and uh, industry. And we have launched a very effective program on the support of the agricultural techniques that will work, such a work this year is going to be broadened for the next year. We're now working with the biggest Ukrainian companies in order to develop Ukrainian producer and help them to come up with the best challenges that they're in their activities. On your question on forest, I think that all of the risks have to be taken into consideration when we're having some kind of a solution. You don't just can't say that that's, you know, we're exporting the forest or not. Every decision has to be calculated and have to be sought about. And we have some obligations in front of our international colleagues. We took upon them and we now have to come up with them. So we have to offer all the countries, all the countries have a different politics on the protection of the inner market or on the priority of different sectors. But then again, getting back to the governance reforms, that governments and state management reform, sometimes the decisions are not being argumented in a nice way. Let us close the export, let us close the import. But the effectiveness of this solution, of this decision, want meets whether Ukraine has to meet the international requirements also and they're not being taken into consideration so sometimes you are thinking about the decision that will not bring you any benefits in any short term or long term perspective so that is why we say that the formula of politics the cost of it the correspondence with the international international duties and obligation, this is the main thing that the ministry has to do. And we have to come up with a solution, having all of, the, all of these discussions about the, all of the interested stakeholders. And then I think we're going to have a very effective governmental decisions. Thank you, Alexander. And I think that all of us, we are on the same boat as you are. We want all of the decisions to be calculated, not only according to the position of the international partner, but also with the, our everyday average Monday logic in order to all of the decisions they shouldn't they should increase the in industry and manufacturing not decrease it they should increase the salaries not decrease it and get the investment like we mentioned if the 500 millions that came from United States and China that again given the money but we're still not on the global investment map and we would like it to be the reason that the solutions that will help the Ukraine to get on the world export and manufacturing map and then we're going to have the work in the welfare that's absolutely understandable thank you very much dear colleagues I would like to turn to in the next part of our discussion I think that we might have three or four questions from the audience we have like around 15 minutes for the for all the questions from the audience and I think that I will provide them all of the panels all of the panelists with a couple of minutes to give in the wrap up and the conclusions for them to give what do they think is the most of the biggest importance for the results for, for the success in Ukraine for the success of Ukrainian economy so please welcome I have two questions the first question is for our international speakers there is the so-called moment of the working culture of the working culture and the work of the, of the society and working perfection of the organization. What kind of problems do you see in Ukraine concerning this and what Ukraine should do to be closer to the developed countries in these questions, to their economics and the organization of the working process? This is a question to our international guests. I also have the question to Mr. Sayenko. What is planned to be done? for the improvement of the management system in the, our governmental bodies according to the best international practices. Thank you.
Господин Александр, может вы? Александр, maybe you will start. Well, what is planned to be done in order to improve the Ukrainian culture? Well, a lot of things have been planned. Like it might have been actually better to ask what have been done during the last week. Yes, really, Victor, you're, you're meaning that. If we're meaning the management in the governmental body, then I'm going to be quite brief about it. I think that is a big mistake when we are saying that we have the limited resources and we are shortening the expenses on the people. I think that the biggest wealth of any country is about its people. And the development of the leadership, development of the management, top management and management, especially in the state services of critical importance. And it's always a best decision to in any critical situation to use efficiently of this human resource. And I think that government is now being focused on this high quality development and high quality selection for the top management of the state management and of the state service. The top management that are going to be participating in the discussions and implementations of the key key governmental decisions. If we speak about the management, if we speak about the management of, this has to be all made on the competition basis. Five or ten years ago, Ukraine didn't have any possibility that the, the head of the central state body is going to be elected in the competition. Now, all of these competitive commissions now we have the competition that is headed by the representative of the civil society that and there is the independent commission who that decides who is going to be the head, and the head of the state-owned bodies. These are the phenomenal, phenomenal things that are going up right now. But taking a step back, the people, the human development, the high-quality selection for the state servicemen, this is the main basis for the success for the further economic development in Ukraine. Thank you, Alexander. And I would like to ask you for the following questions. Uh, but Unfortunately, we well, like, can you have a brief question? A brief question, please address your question. Motion office, Ukraine Invest. I would like to address my question to Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham, you mentioned that Ukraine hasn't looked uh, for growing the GDP and the free trade, such an indicators and instruments which could bring wealth to Ukraine. Yeah, uh, could you please mention which instruments should we use from your point of view, from your experience, Ukraine, which economic instruments to use? to uh, increase its wealth. Thank you. I mean, you, 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 can, you can increase your, your economic financial wealth very simply and very quickly by selling, selling your resources. I mean, you can sell your forests, you can sell your wheat, and you can raise lots of money. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, about raising the well-being, raising the standard of living of people. And that requires uh, a different approach to work, I think, a redefinition of what work is, and a different approach to, to, to the distribution of the income you get from selling resources. When it comes to investment, it also requires some protection. I, I mean, uh, we heard before about China. I mean, China has been a huge success, arguably unique, although there are countries that have followed similar paths in the last 50 years, Taiwan, Japan, uh, Korea, they've been successful because they protected local industries. They protected their businesses and allowed them to grow. So if you're going to get the wealth you could, which you can get quickly from selling your resources, you have to invest it in something and then protect that, whatever it is you invested in. And that's what I say about not being completely open to trade. You have to protect your assets, allow them to grow and develop, and then you can bring down the trade barriers. But don't just think that you can, you can compete with China in manufacturing, or you compete with, 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 with Europe in banking or services with the small scale that you've got. You can't. The only way you can do that is by protecting them. So, so if, if, you, if you create wealth, nurture it. I think that's the main message. Nurture what you've got and let it grow. Don't let it be squandered. Thank you. Professor, do, do you want that? No? Well, uh, I think this is a, a very important thing. We're talking about China, <clears throat> and we're talking about successes. But if you look at China and India, reasonably successful, they started protecting their industries before 1950. <clears throat> and they opened up very gradually, just as the United States opened up very gradually. And, <clears throat> and, and, and I think 
there is an important message here that uh, I think, to, to me, it seems that the Ukraine has entered into free trade agreements far too early. Uh, and and uh, your enthusiasm for free trade has, has uh, caused deals that are very difficult to, 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 to go back on. So, so, so I think uh, this issue here, which my colleague here is, is, is raising, is, is, is very important. You know, no country has ever got rich without protecting their manufacturing industry. England did it for 400 years. The Americans only did it for 100 years. In South Korea only did it for 40 years, but they've all done it. So you, you, I'm sorry, you don't get around that. And I think it is in the interest of Europe and the West that the Ukraine is not a poor country. But, but, but uh, that's not obvious that they understand at the moment. They have given you a Morgenthau plan. And the Morgenthau plan, a deindustrialization plan, which, which was turned into... Uh, when, when the West saw how poor Germany was, well, then they, uh, you know, the people from West Germany fled into East Germany because they were richer. So that's when the Marshall Plan came up. And, and, and I think uh, this is a similar thing. We have this in, 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 in Europe. We have Latvia, where more than 20% of the population has already left. Well, if 20% of the, of the Ukrainian population leaves, well, you have 7, 8 million people. So, so the seriousness of this I think is, is, is not, uh, is, has not occurred on, uh, on Europe, and I think you have to remind them. Thank you. Thank you for such direct remarks. Yeah. I have questions. Volodymyr Panchenko, CMD Ukraine, the Brain Center. There's a lot of advice that we have heard and a lot of advices that have been given by different experts from 2014, but what we have seen, there were like three slogans of the out nowadays, this forum, so protectionism, then looking for this for different situation for the inputs and innovation. And we see the gap between what the prominent minds, as Graham Maxstone or Eric Reiner says, and what and and this gap on what the people say and how it is re, what is the reaction of the European Commission and what is the reaction of Ukrainian government on what what has been said, and I would like to ask both Mr. Maxstone and maybe all of the speakers presented today the panel. In what way something that we already know can be implemented for the governmental activities? Because what we have managed to do for this year is that we now know what we have to do. And whatever we ask, there's are like all the general details. But we understand that this year's forum slogan, that's protectionism, that's looking for the new ways of, of expel the import and innovations. How do you think it can be implemented in the executive authorities for the executive authorities. We do understand that the executive authorities of Ukraine, they are really under the influence of our donors, under the influence of our European partners. And the conversations are not happening. And we're not doing anything in action. We're just talking about protectionism and looking for the new ways of input, expelling, and again, retention. We've, we've, we've got something a bit like the need for a, a, a Copernican moment. Because today we, we have a belief a bit like the world is flat. We have this belief that GDP growth is gonna help, that small government is good, that less regulation is good, that openness to trade is good. And this mentality has become fixed in our heads. And it, it's by design. I mean, there was a group called the Mont Pelerin Society, which started in the late 1940s which fed into universities and educational institutions and to think tanks, which has got us all thinking in this, this neoliberal free market way that that's the answer to all our problems. And what it does is it makes the rich rich. Now, we need to, we need to ha ha have some fundamental rethinking about this whole approach. And we need, for a start, to have a strong state. If you look at the, the gap between rich and poor, when it began to shrink, the only time that it really shrank in the 20th century was after the Second World War, where the gap between rich and poor got smaller. 
Now, we had a free market system then, we had a capitalist system, but we also had a strong state, a state which acted as a balancing mechanism, which restricted the activities of big corporations, which looked after the benefits of the majority. That's what we need again, something which is more balanced, which is more in keeping with a sustainable, more environmentally protective, more e equal society. So if you want to have any message to your government, it's think about balance. Don't just think about pushing hard on the GDP accelerator, because that will result in a very divided medieval society. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Wojzo, would you like to uh, give remarks on that? Um, does it work? Uh, um, Mr. Goldslag, I, 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 will, yeah. uh, I will represent you. And uh, Jonathan Holslag uh, <coughs> joined us, co-founder of the Brussels Institute of Contemporary uh, China Studies. Jonathan works on international uh, politics at the Free University Brussels uh, with a particular interest in China, rise, Europe's uh, relation with Asia, security, and international economy. Professor Holzlach wrote several popular books on China as an emerging great power, in particular his book, The Power of Paradise, which in part provides an outline for the European Union response to the changing world order. Apart from his academic work, he has been advising most of the European institutions, several governments, and the international organizations. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, and sorry, sorry for being late, but it was a little bit of a logistical nightmare uh, this morning, and as you can see, my suits are still lost in action. Uh, so anyhow, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to share the stage. Uh, I just picked up the last, uh, the last sentences of my, uh, my co-panelists, and I think what was um, stated is is spot on. Uh, you might recollect that we in the parliament had a, had a discussion a few months ago about uh, exactly the way uh, that Ukraine should, uh, should go in terms of its economic policy and also... Sorry? Could, could you speak right to, uh, to the microphone? Yeah. yeah, thank you. And also how it could strike this balance between on the one hand embracing globalization and trade and attracting foreign investment from, from a host of countries uh, and on the other hand, also setting its own goals. Um, and I think this is indeed uh, a very important issue, not only confined to Ukraine. Um, we in Brussels and the European Commission uh, are having discussions all the time about how we should kickstart economic um, uh, growth and how also we should go beyond sort of um, the recovery thinking that has uh, dominated the European discussion since 2009 uh, or so. Um, what strikes me in a lot of these talks is that we are still uh, confining ourselves in many ways um, to, let's say, starry-minded um, uh, arguments related to either we should invest more or we should attract more foreign investment or we should um, uh, carry out more austerity measures even uh, so as to give uh, a bit more scope to, uh, to private investors. Uh, I think what economic and good economic policy starts with is a social project in the first place. What do you stand for as a society? Uh, and I also believe that such a social uh, project should always try to aim at better. Uh, not to conserve what we have in terms of industries, not to um, uh, preserve what we um, uh, have in terms of infrastructure, but to develop um, uh, better. And then I think it is the task of the government to steer um, uh, capital uh, in a way that it, it, it suits these, um, these policies, and that often is missing. Uh, I think uh, attracting investment in many ways, mostly foreign investment, has become a sort of a supplement of good domestic economic policy. You have governments rolling out the red carpets, uh, sending out the one investment delegation after the other, whereas at the same time they don't have a clue how exactly all this, um, this investment uh, is going to benefit their societies. And I think it's detrimental. Uh, and if I follow a little bit the discussions here in, in, in Ukraine, if I follow what's written in the newspaper, I think it's a pitfall um, that also lays ahead for the Ukrainian government. There's a sense of being weak, and I think there are many weaknesses, uh, as there are in most of, uh, of the countries in, uh, in Europe. Um, but it's not out of a weakness that you have to uh, craft an investment policy. It's, out, uh, it's, it's, it's departing from your strengths. And I think agriculture is one, your logistic position is, um, is one. Um, the fact that you still have an entrepreneurial people in, uh, in, many, in many sectors is an asset. Uh, and then you go ahead. 
So that would be my, uh, let's say, main uh, argument popping in uh, almost at the end of the discussion. Um, so government has certainly a role to play and it should not be um, either globalization or state, it should be both. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, Mr. Would you, would you like to, to give remarks on that? Yeah, it's confusing having two Jonathans. <laughs> so, the, uh, no, I, I wanted to just pick up on this issue of uh, economic instruments and uh, production mentalities. I mean, I come from China, so far be it from me to say that the state should not be in a leading role. Obviously, the state has been in a leading role uh, in China pretty much since the get-go. Um, but the state uh, acts in a way which says, we are going to protect the fundamentals of society, we will provide stability, we will ensure that the system is, is working uh, for the vast majority of people, and then we will compete. And then we will compete and we will put pressure on those entities in society that are supposed to compete, on the business people, on the enterprise, and we expect them to achieve a global level of competitive advantage. We do not, we will, we will help them, and we will support them, but we ultimately put them to the test. Uh, and they have to participate, otherwise they in turn just become another tax uh, on the people. And we do not want to tax the people any more than they already are. So, I mean, this is a sort of a balancing act. It's sort of at one, how, how much openness do you allow, how much pressure do you put, and how much stability do you want, and how, many, how much support can you give. Uh, and that is why we have to do it step by step and in different places at different times. So clusters and, uh, and special zones and special areas are a way of testing what's going to work here. But one important thing, if you have a cluster, it is not just a marketing tool. I meet people who say, like, I, I spent a lot of money on marketing my cluster and nothing happened. Well, I don't, I, yeah, obviously. This is not about marketing. This is about doing something different. This is about having a real change, having a real new approach to business, uh, which includes the rule of law, but it includes technology, it includes the rights of labor, it includes the ability to raise capital, it includes an attitude towards the environment, it includes a whole supplier infrastructure. It's not just a piece of paper. Uh, it's actually a different approach with different people, usually, uh, and a different way of doing things. And I think that becomes very clear once you, once you compare, once you compare your clusters and your zones to others. So I would start there. I would really think there is an opportunity here. And I believe there is so much that the technology gives you, just the last point, Globalization, the world of globalization, the old globalization is, is goods you know, being shipped across borders. Uh, in the last 15 years, the single biggest growth in globalization has been data. There is now $3 trillion worth of global data traffic. Globalization is knowledge intensive and it's about everybody. It's not just about big companies. Uh, it's, this is open to everyone with the world of the micro multinational. Uh, so everyone can go global for right now, but how do you take, how do you so open up that opportunity? That is what government does. Government has to enable those small and medium sized enterprises, which are the backbone of any economy, which employ most of the people and would create most of the jobs. <laughs> that, is the, you know, that is what government needs to do. Is so how do we help those companies become global and succeed in a global marketplace. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Wozel. And uh, let me ask the last question, uh, Professor Holslach, as he joined us uh, later, and then we will uh, wrap up and uh, have a final remarks uh, for for speaker. Uh, dear Professor Holslach, as you as you probably know, the Ukrainian government is deliberately idealizing the European integration uh, course of Ukraine, is in openly uh, putting the European Union uh, recommendations uh, on top of Ukraine's national interests. In, in, in several cases. Your advice is fundamentally different, and I will say to you, uh, because it's, it's, it's really uh, matters. <clears throat> you shouldn't expect too much from Europe. You should concentrate on strengthening your economy from inside. Such policies should be backed up by diversification of strategic partnerships. How can we really strengthen our economy, and with whom and how should we build alliances on the international arena? Please. That's a good question. Now, first of all, I would like to state that some of the expectations or some of the suggestions from Brussels or the European Union are valuable. I sure. think um, combating Absolutely. corruption, investing in infrastructure, investing in education, I think it's essential, not only for Ukraine, but for all countries. Um, so uh, then about this issue of diversifying strategic partnerships. Well, the problem with Europe, of course, is that um, uh, 
we are struggling ourselves to, uh, to, to, to kickstart growth uh, and to create jobs. So the result of that is that European companies have become less eager to invest. Like the share of European investment uh, globally has dropped um, uh, significantly. Also, our position in global trade is being affected by this, um, this period of, uh, of uncertainty. Our share in Ukraine's exports uh, is going down slowly. So do not put all your eggs in the EU basket, um, but that definitely requires that you have to be very smart towards the other candidates that would like to become part of the uh, Ukrainian economic uh, success story. And I think then you have a few candidates. First of all, there is, um, there is China. Uh, I'm just back from, uh, from Odessa and visited some of the, the ports in that neighborhood. And you see that there is a clear interest from China uh, to invest, especially in the port uh, sector. But do you want to have these investments confined to ports? Because China's agenda is quite clear. It does not want to build industries in these ports. It wants to ship its own goods uh, uh, in uh, this country via the ports. So that, I think, has to, to be steered, I think, uh, very, very carefully by, uh, by the government. Um, same for the interest of countries like China and the Gulf states in agriculture. Like what most of these countries want is not per se to ha add a lot of value uh, in, say, food processing industries in Ukraine. They want to get access to the raw materials, to the agricultural raw materials. And I think this should, avo should be avoided. It's normal for a country like, say, China or South Korea that they want to have the cereals and the corn uh, and so forth. But it's also normal for Ukraine that you want this to be processed in high quality products before it leaves the country. And I think this is exactly what China has done very well in the last decades. It has, it has identified its, its, its different potentials very well. And then it has basically uh, um, uh, come to certain conclusions about which supporting role foreign investors could play, again, in function of the national and domestic industries. So bending the interest of emerging powers, emerging markets into an opportunity for, I would say, um, sustainable growth and also more um, uh, value added in, in the economic activities, this is really key. Do not just replace the EU by China, but, but turn China into something much more productive when it comes to, uh, to different gains for the Ukrainian society. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Very valuable recommendations for us. Um, Dear colleagues, we would like to turn up to the wrapping up moment of our panel and I would like to ask all of the panelists to have five minutes to give us the most important conclusion of what is the recipe, the success recipe for Ukraine. How can we improve uh, the economical growth of Ukraine? How can we make the economical growth of Ukraine inclusive in order to cope with all of the people who live in Ukraine? To make it long-term oriented, to make it sustainable, to make it inclusive. How to shift this orbit that we are now. How to change this orbit into a successful orbit. And I would like to, again, ask the same question in a different direction now. So please, I would like to ask ask Alexander Sayanko to start with this wrapping up remarks. Victor, thank you very much. I think it's been a very interesting discussion that we're joined today. We've heard many strategies how Ukraine and other countries worked. We've heard many different models and have very different opinions. But if we were not speaking about the economical, the particular economic strategy of Ukraine, but Speaking of Ukrainian economics, I would say that there's a problem of a need of, there is the need of professional capacities of the people that they have the state post, whether we're speaking about the public service, whether we think about healthcare or education. I think that what we experience, the problem the biggest problem than corruption or any others, the problem of professional development of growth. If the person will know and if they're going to be evolving, professionally evolving on the post it takes, and they will be doing, they will be implementing their capacities of the high quality, they will give good results and they will succeed in their position, they won't have they won't be bribed, they won't feel stressed while changing their position and so on. If we have a high quality human capacity strategy, it's going to be better for us. Right now when we're on the We've ended this 
transition period for Ukraine after gaining our independence. And right now, we have to pay particular attention for the good human capital on all of the levels of the state governance. We need professional staff. We need professional people in healthcare, education, public service. We need people who know know people who know how to how to work on strategy how to implement the strategy and then we will succeed if we build this kind of a system when the person will be able to work of a high quality to provide the high quality solutions on on their work and their post then we will implement all of the all of these opportunities and all this recommendation that we've heard from our international speakers thank you thank you alexander uh, so, uh, what do you think? How can Ukraine make an economic uh, breakthrough and uh, set itself on sustainable uh, development path? What, what are your recommendations? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I very much agree with what the other Jonathan said. <laughs> so that uh, you know, there is a there's an opportunity staring Ukraine right in the face. You know, and it's uh, it's to cause three billion consumers, and uh, you know, with uh, the one belt one road policy. I mean, this is all about up to Ukraine to figure out how it takes advantage. And you say either you do it or you don't, but you should do it. You should take. You should figure out how to how to play this and capture the value added, not just be another resource supplier, but use the talents and the strengths of your people. As Alexander said. The strength of a country is its people. I believe that was the chairman uh, said that also. And uh, that it is, you know, that you have this opportunity, so you must take it. And it would be a crime not to take it. So really build on the, on, on the initiative and the new wealth that is coming out of emerging markets to, uh, to be a gateway, the, the geographic position, but also the talent of the people. Uh, and to do that, you will need to have as we keep talking about, a, an investor-friendly uh, environment. You need to have a way of dealing with people that allows them to feel that they can invest and get a return and be conducting business as normal. Uh, and if you have to do that in only a part of the country instead of the whole country, that's okay. Uh, but you have to do it. There has to be a way of doing it so that you can have this conversation with people from beyond the country. I, I believe that is ultimately the role of government, is to ensure that there is a secure enough supply of that environment uh, to support the transformation of enterprises, as was said, the, uh, the, role, the changing the role of state-owned enterprises that has been a big experience in China as well, uh, and to support the growth of small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, importantly, communicating this to the people of the Ukraine to say what is in it for you uh, and how do you get to participate and what are the things that you should do yourself personally to educate yourself uh, to become more uh, involved in society in order to participate and what are the things you should not do? Uh, what are the ways in which, what are the behaviors that are not helpful uh, to, a, uh, to a productive environment? And of course, we have to safeguard the environment. The environment is a very real uh, context. And if we do not, if we waste it, we lose it. Uh, and so that we must put a, a, a realization of the value of the environment in every aspect of our economic activities. Uh, and so that is what government is there to do. And that is what the people in this room should hold the government accountable for doing. Uh, but with that, there is a tremendous opportunity here. There's an opportunity for growth, uh, and there's an opportunity for improvement of the quality of life, and an opportunity for the sustainability of the environment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Holslock, the floor is yours. Thank you. So how to um, spearhead inclusive growth? Um, I would like to present uh, four or five um, concrete um, proposals. Uh, first of all, avoiding getting soaked into dependencies. And there again, we learn from China. If there is anything, I believe, that drives China's economic policies or has been driven China's economic policies in the last decades. It is this fixation with economic security. We should grow, we should embrace globalization, but on our terms. We don't want to replace the one dependency by, uh, by another. It's a very, very difficult balancing exercise, but for Ukraine, this is essential. Um, second, education. Education in different ways. Not only education to form professionals, I think this is of course essential, but also education to form citizens. Like going for the professionals without advancing citizenship in, a, in education is detrimental. This is again something that China does um, uh, very, very well. Forming consumers, 
Like learning people to produce is one thing, but how to learn them to consume, uh, how to appreciate quality, how to appreciate sustainability, how to distinguish the junk from something that has true value in it as a product and a service. That I believe is also uh, key and upholding dignity in education. Whatever, ha whatever happens, uh, I think the main lesson uh, through schools should be that dignity is the core uh, of everything. Organizing the marketplace. Organizing the marketplace in a way that it is investor uh, friendly, yes, but also in a way that, is, that it sets clear standards, quality standards, safety standards um, uh, for companies, all um, uh, actors on the, on the marketplace. Um, in a way that it benefits the society. So there again, a steering role for the, for the government. Infrastructure development, harnessing domestic savings and domestic capital to boost infrastructure. Again, there we can learn from, uh, from China. And then last but not least, governance. Governance, governance, and governance. Uh, invest in, in, in talent, invest in transparency. Uh, and I think then slowly you can, uh, you can make, uh, make progress and you can uh, go for a growth model that is inclusive and that embraces dignity at the core. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Graham. Uh, what, what are the top priorities? Uh, what do you think? Okay. Uh, we're, we're entering something like a fourth, a fourth stage of, of, of development in terms of industrial development. The first stage was agriculture, and then came the Industrial Revolution, which started in England and then spread to, to the United States and the rest of Europe. And, and we were able to make a huge increase in productivity, which led uh, economic growth comes from productivity, Jonathan, what Jonathan was talking about. The next stage was to move from the Industrial Revolution into the Services Revolution, which, which took place in the second half of the, of the 20th century. And today, we're moving into an era where there's going to be this mass digitalization, as, as Jonathan talked about. Now, that's very seductive, and it sounds very appealing, that we can, we can suddenly digitize everything and there's lots of growth opportunities there. And it will boost productivity dramatically. And higher productivity will lead to lots of growth. But that will be very good for business. That will be very good for GDP. It will not be good for society unless the benefits of that digitization, unless the benefits of that increase in productivity are shared and redistributed. It will also not be good for employment. If you look at companies like Google or Amazon or, or, or Tesla, they have a fraction of the number of employees that companies like Volkswagen or the Indian Railways or Toyota or the post office have. So again, you need to rethink employment with the digitization. And the jobs that will be left are those which are in care looking after other people, cutting hair, playing in orchestras, jobs which cannot be mechanized. So, my recommendations are, first of all, protect. Protect what you've got. Protect the industries and the jobs that you have. Secondly, redistribute, so that the benefits of digitization, the benefits of the new wave of economic development are shared across society. Focus on services, care, and IT and redefine what we mean by work, so that you include many more people into the economy, mothers that look after children, people that look after the elderly, and pay these people a wage so that everybody can benefit from the revolution that's about to take place. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Professor Reinert, what, what do you think? Well, I think there is a lot to be learned from China. Uh, but the problem is that the context is extremely different. And, and uh, I think we then have to look back, back at what China did for a long time before they got where they are now. And, and, and from that point of view, the Ukraine is in a very different uh, situation. Um, if we go back and look at what was really the strategy of the European Union, the European Union in 1988 published a report called the Cecchini Report, and an Italian economist. The Cecchini Report was the theoretical foundation for the single market in 1992. And Mr. Cecchini, the economist, was asked to quantify what, were the, what would be the benefits of the single market and about 85% of those benefits were increasing returns. 
every company will get a bigger market, so their costs will fall. This was the logic of the European Union. And the European Union also had that logic when Spain joined the EU and everything was done to protect the industry of Spain, etc. Et so I think we have to understand that with the fall of the Berlin Wall, actually something happened to Western mentality that we, 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 we went bananas in a way. You know, it was, it was the end of the history, it was the end of the nation state, it was the end of whatnot, but the fundamental old rules still apply. Uh, so I think we have to go back to a more basic strategy and the more basic strategy, I think the, the, the term value added has come up here and that is very important. You had to add value to what you have. That means you don't sell you, your wheat to Italy for one euro and buy it back for, in the form of spaghetti for 50 euros. You actually have to go back to these basic things. You know, people were talking about this uh, hundreds of years ago, and, and, and it, it's, it, that logic was still the logic of the EU until 1992. I mean, you have to go back to the, uh, back to the strategy of the EU before, before it actually uh, become, became ideologically fixed. So your problem is similar to the problem of Portugal and of Greece, who lost their industry. You know, if you said to Mr. Cecchini, well, Mr. Cecchini, if some of these industries, if some of these countries actually lose their manufacturing industry, does that mean that they will lose 85% of the benefits from the EU? And he would have had to say yes, because the benefits of the EU was, was increasing returns. That was perhaps in a too static way. And I think there is, there is a problem now with the wage structure in Europe. You know, as a businessman, you know that the choice of technology is decided by the price of labor versus the price of capital, right? So, so if labor is very expensive, you choose a different strategy. Well, what's happening in my country, in Norway, <clears throat> is that in Oslo, in construction sites where there are less than six floors, they do not uh, install lifts anymore because it's, pe it's, it's less expensive to have people from Eastern Europe climb up with a with a building materials on their back, right? These people tend to come from Poland. Uh, when I was in Western Ukraine earlier this year, I heard the story that, well, you know, there are a lot of construction workers here in summer who go to Poland. And I said, yes, that's because all the Polish construction workers are going to, to Norway. So this kind, there is a, a cascade here of, 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 from high wage to low wage, and unfortunately, the Ukraine at the moment is at the bottom of that value chain. You're, you're at the bottom of that supply chain. And, and you, your problems is exactly the same as Greece and Portugal, just multiplied by a factor of something, right? So the EU, if they, if they think about it, they will understand your problem as being the problem of their periphery, the EU periphery as well. So I think you have to go back to the to, to the basics of adding value and understanding that w what is called richness of raw materials elsewhere in Latin America is called the resource curse. You know, because you have resources, you're poorer. Why did Japan and Switzerland do so well? Well, because they were fortunate enough not to have any resources, so they had to, they had to specialize in other things. So uh, your resources are, in a sense, a curse that you used to be the corn chamber or the wheat chamber of the world is a curse. And it's, it's a curse which gets a lot worse when I'm told that well, you, the quota you get for exporting tomatoes to the EU ran out on the 20th of January for the whole year and the quota for something else ran out on the 15th of February. You know, the, 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 the cards have been stacked against you. <laughs> and and you, should, you should protest. I think that these cards have been stacked so much against you, and I think you have to go back to, to what China and other countries used to do earlier, which was adding value, my, my wheat spaghetti example, I think. And, and, and also, building on my neighbor here, uh, food processing industry employs a lot of people. You know, it, it's very labor intensive. That's another good thing about it. And, and you save a lot of transportation costs, it, it's friendly, you know, it, it, it's environmental friendly, uh, you know, 
don't ship food all over the world when you can, when you can, uh, when you can uh, transform your own food here at home. Thank you. Professor Anya, thank you so much for such a, such a clear message. And you know, several days ago, when uh, Steve Wozniak uh, was in Kyiv, uh, co-founder of Apple, uh, we've, uh, we had a um, discussion panel on innovation and, and business uh, perspectives. And uh, one of investors into Ukraine offered uh, Karchner, he said, uh, please don't rent your brain. Uh, he, uh, he was talking on uh, Ukrainian ITO industry, IT outsourcing, yeah? And I answered him, uh, offer, we are not uh, renting our brains, we are selling our brains in our hands, because over uh, 1.5 million Ukrainians left only for Poland in order to find uh, the, uh, their jobs and uh, they left their families and actually it's, uh, it's unbelievable. So we really should change our economic course and our economic model. It's about, uh, it's about uh, the future of our country. It, it uh, matters uh, a lot uh, for us. And uh, I will do all my best uh, that your advices, your voice will be heard in Ukrainian parliament. And I hope that uh, Mr. Sayenka will do the same for, uh, for uh, the Ukrainian government and uh, that we will really uh, push and um, pave a new road for for Ukraine. We really need this. So, so thank you, uh, our uh, dear panelists. It was uh, it was very important and very useful. I uh, I written a lot of things, uh, and I hope uh, our participants they also very interested in in our panel. And I'd like to inform you that you uh, today you can uh, get a book by Mr. Uh, Maxton, which we uh, translated uh, into Ukrainian with the facilitation of uh, Ukrainian Association of the Club of Rome and uh, with the support of uh, Arkada Commercial Bank and Konstantin Palivada. And today you can get this uh, unique book here in, in, in Ukraine. And um, I will um, open a small secret uh, for you that uh, we will do all our best that next year you can find uh, here at the, the, at the forum the new book uh, by Professor uh, Reinhardt. So I think that uh, it's uh, worth coming to the fifth uh, Kyiv International Economic uh, Forum uh, next year, we will uh, have an anniversary. So thank you uh, so much for, for your bright speech. Thank you for your attention and uh, see you at the next panel.